Hey, people. All right, last one, last one of the semester. And then I will be working on the test tonight. You will have plenty of time to do it, whatever the last day of, of finals is. Um, I think finals technically start tomorrow. Is it Thursday to Thursday? Something like that is finals week. So at the end of next week is, is the end of finals. So you'll have a week to do it. I'll get the thing posted by tomorrow morning is my is my goal. Uh, and you just do it as many times as you need. I wouldn't put it off until the last day just in case you end up, well, I lost internet today or something. And it's, but it's a hassle at that point. But you'll know how you scored. Uh, so I won't be able to submit grades until the final day if people if people put it off until the final day. Uh, but you'll know exactly how you scored. And what are the two things this semester for grades? Test one, test two. And like everyone got an A on test one. So you, you'll know how you do in the class. And, and just put in the effort you need to to get the grade you want and then go do summary. Let me pull it up. We're just, it's nothing but recommendations today. The last lecture uh, on Monday was just pure doom. It was just doom and I don't know, doom sounds worse than gloom. So there was no room for gloom. It was all doom and the world is going to end if you miss an hour of sleep. So that's what we talked about on on Monday. And while there's truth to it, it's also like everybody in the universe um, has sleeping problems of, of some sort or another. Um, some degree of insomnia, it's, it's, a, it's among the most common ailments. So you are among uh, sympathetic peers. You are among, there, there's compassion. And I don't know why people, I mean, JP, you, ha you have your banner, you have your Dodgers, your, your Dodgers banner of insomnia behind you. Um, and I think it's really good for people to be open about um, whatever they're suffering from, because otherwise everyone feels alone in their suffering, whatever it is, any, any, you know, symptom, any condition, any struggle that people are going through man, there's a lot of people who are going through the exact same thing. And I think the biggest disservice to, to those people is to let them feel alone in that, in that struggle, in that condition, and you know, lying asleep all night thinking, I'm the only one in the universe who suffers. Um, there is a community who's, who suffers with you, but it, there are very effective ways that you can depart that community. Um, now, it doesn't always work. So, you know, for my, I used to have horrible sleeping problems. My average sleep was between maybe four and five hours uh, a night for years. Um, if I hit six hours, I would celebrate. I mean, that's how, I, I don't know, I went years and I never once hit eight. Uh, and then I realized there's actually stuff I can do. Um, drugs don't work. I tried the drugs and they just, I fell down the stairs with one of them. I was sleepwalking and I fell down the stairs. Um, I, I, I had this weird, vivid dream that somebody was kidnapped uh, downstairs. And in the middle of the night, I'm walking down the stairs looking for the person and I trip and fall. But my hand print went all the way down the stairwell. And I woke up in the morning. I'm like, man, I got weird neck pain. Like, well, yeah, you fell down the stairs last night. It was what my, you know, at the time girlfriend would uh, told me like, oh, that was real. Um, but I, you don't wake up, you know, rested. You don't wake up as though you slept. If you, maybe you don't wake up with neck pain, but, but there's a lot of problems with, with pharmacological interventions. Will there always be problems with pharmacological interventions? Probably not. Uh, in 20 years, 25 years, um, will the pharmaceutical industry have something to offer us? I think so. Uh, do they have anything to offer us today? It's pretty clear that they don't. Um, now, there are some conditions, there are some cases in which it is advisable and Definitely, uh, if if uh, you know insomnia or or any other related sleep condition is something that you you know are suffering from, I go to don't talk to a general practitioner. I was like, oh, let's give you Ambien or whatever. Like, oh, that's not good. Um, 
but if you talk to a specialist, uh, I know JP, I think you've been through the sleep studies. I've been through the sleep studies um, and sort of monitoring the sleep and the, and the brain waves and, and, you know, your O2 stats in the night and, and all of this stuff, you know, getting an expert, uh, but the first line of, of treatment should not be a prescription uh, because there's just too many side effects for too little uh, positive effect. But let's talk about ways to naturally and more effectively become, you know, sleeping you, sleeping whoever. Um, first off, just a little reminder, I'm not going to do the stuff you should know section <clears throat> for today, but if you have a sleepy career, let's not talk health problems, let's talk athleticism, that's, that's a brighter easier to stomach topic. If you're sleepy, you're Mario and you're sleeping away on the dugout. Uh, careers, I don't care what sport it is. This is one for baseball. Your career is shortened. How long are you going to be in the MLB if you're a sleepy player? Not very long. Um, so say the data, and this, this is just, you know, why I, I could pick a thousand of these, of these abstracts to make any number of points, but they're all sort of agree on the same story. Um, I, we could tell the story of plate discipline, you know, your, your performance uh, playing the game. Are you swing, plate discipline, meaning are you swinging at pitches you should not be swinging at? And how tired are you? Right? And, and your performance is going to be bad. Uh, now, in Why We Sleep, that Matthew Walker book, uh, there's an NBA performance where, where uh, this, you know, figure 11, where he says, what happens among players who sleep uh, more than eight hours as compared to uh, players who sleep fewer than eight. Ah, just everything you want to see in, in a player. And you, you don't see these, effects. I mean, if you start comparing something like six hours to eight hours, nine hours to you know five and a half hours, these are not effects you can get with drugs. I mean, I'm talking anabolic steroids, EPO, stuff like that. The, the power of, of sleep, of adequate sleep on recovery and performance and longevity and focus and, and every domain that you can, uh, that affects you on the court, uh, on the mound, in the water, wherever you're performing, you cannot get this effect with drugs. Uh, and yet, people aren't sleeping. Well, just give me the steroids uh, or the EPO or something and, and I'll just train, train, train and I'll get inadequate sleep. That's foolish. Right, that is that's a horrible way of 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 training and 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 perceiving the world of athletics and your role in it, or your athlete's role in it. Um, now, this is just performance in, in basketball. This is just down the road a long way uh, at Stanford. Uh, so at the professional level, we see this. We see the professional level in baseball. We see the college level in baseball. Name a sport, and there's been a study that shows sleeping is one of the most powerful ergogenic aids that you can uh, give your players. But people don't want to do it. And in part, we have a structure. We have a scholastic structure that says, everybody get up early. But we know that is a, is a great contradiction, uh, a devastating contradiction to biology. Um, and so we're seeing deteriorated performances. We're seeing people entering their freshman year and exiting their senior year, and they're no better, right? They didn't improve. How did you not improve? Just benign neglect, natural maturation should have made you a better athlete uh, during this time. Um, but, and again, we're going to have some sleepless nights now and again, I'm at a particularly stressful point in the semester. I slept about two, two and a half hours uh, last night, but I gave myself, I am, I am ruthless about giving myself what's called sleep opportunity. And now that I manage all of my, uh, the light profile, the temperature uh, in my house, I take a couple of supplements, I'll talk about them. I was, I was tempted not to talk about them because that's not what I want people to focus on. What I want people to focus on is the stuff that's meaningful, the stuff that really matters. Um, and that's light. You know, that's, it's planetary things. It's stuff where if you don't do it right, 100% of people end up with insomnia if you abuse that system. Now, 100%, I'm rounding up because maybe it's like 97.8% of people or something. It's so close to 100% that it's actually reasonable to round up to every living human if you don't manage these variables well. Um, nearly everyone alive is susceptible to insomnia, and we're not doing a good job of managing these variables. And 
that when I changed my average sleep, I probably gained about three hours a night um, of my mean amount of sleep that I get. Uh, it was between I don't know, it was probably close to four and a half is, is what it was. And then now it's probably close between seven, seven and a half, something like that is my is my mean amount of sleep. And all I did to, to, to get that was the exact same stuff that I'm going to be telling you today. Um, it, you know, the drugs didn't work. You know, the pharmacological stuff didn't work other than like neck pain and stuff. But if you extend sleep, people don't want to do this, but if you extend it at the college level, if you extend it at the professional level, if you extend it at, you know, juvie, you're going to see the same effect. I mean, it's like outrageous what, what you get. And so these extending sleep beyond one's habitual levels, what people would ordinarily do when they ordinarily go to bed, when they ordinarily um, get out of bed, that's, that's not what we should be getting. Now, you'll see things like, you know, the BMI where people say, what's the healthiest BMI where you should be? And it's not, you know, in the low end of normal weight or something like that. It's like, well, you know, looking at lifespan, things like this, let's just breach that overweight uh, threshold a little bit. You know, 25 to 30 is overweight. Let's sneak into that one just barely. Um, let's let's hang out in that 25-ish zone. There's some evidence that says that. Now, there's, there's a, this is a big there's a lot of commentary. This is a big subject to talk about, but you do see a similar effect with where it goes too high, the BMI goes too high, and you're looking at cardiovascular profiles that are disadvantageous for things like survival. Um, the BMI goes too low, and you see the same thing. There's an optimal zone. Now, people will talk about that optimal zone in sleep and say, well, it's eight hours. And so it's, no, 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 it's only like six hours, eight hours. It's like people always just use eight for everything. You need eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day. You need eight hours of sleep. Everyone just says eight for everything because it's a nice round number. Even just get rid of your thumbs and there's your eight. Um, eight hours is a reasonable number. Um, so is nine. So is nine hours. And I wish I could get nine. It's not something that I'll, I think I'll ever get nine hours. But, but there's evidence that says, you know, people who are getting nine hours, nine and a half hours, you know, you, you're getting toward that double digit, you cross into the double digit. People who get that much sleep uh, tend to have worse health, uh, poorer outcomes, um, potential problems. Now, think epidemiology here. Think the type of people who that type of premise. And if people are getting nine and a half hours of sleep, they may have some ailment because when you have the flu, what do you do? You sleep all day. When you have cancer, when you have, when you have a condition, the best way to resolve that condition is, all right, let me just put myself into sleeping beauty mode for a while and see if I can deal with this, see if I can address this with my eyes closed. Um, that's often the best way to address illness. And so the type of people who are getting more sleep may have underlying problems that are causing that extra sleep. If you look at healthy populations, you, you don't really see that. Nine hours is totally fine. Eight hours is a great number to get. Anybody who says less than eight hours, um, oh, you know, between six and seven is totally fine. There are human beings who can do that. There are human beings who are capable of doing that and, and not suffering drastic consequences, but they are rare. Uh, eight hours of sleep, if you're under that, you're probably experiencing uh, deficits. And remember, these deficits are going to come in memory, in um, oh, problem solving, uh, you know, puzzles and stuff like that. You know, how can you unscramble these words and, and can you remember this many phone numbers or whatever? How far do you get into pie? You know, it's just fact memorization. Cognitive skills, thinking is multifaceted, just like there's a lot of different athletes here. We have, there's a baseball player, water polo, swimming, basketball, uh, soccer. There's a lot of different athletes present at, at right now or is your body fit well it depends for what you know am i fit to be a weightlifter am i fit to be a swimmer am i fit to be a sprinter am i fit to be a shot putter right um so we have we have um field uh on call too and so there's all these different expressions of human performance and there are different expressions of cognitive performance and all of them Every single expression of cognitive performance suffers if you're getting inadequate sleep. And again, you can improve. And some of those expressions of cognitive uh, function, like where is the primary motor cortex? 
it's like where my headphones are. It's, it's like this band that lives sort of like right where my headphones are. Um, it's up in your central nervous system. So if you want your motor cortex to function, if you want to have um, effective reaction time and coordination, and if you want to be smooth like a ballerina in all of your motions, whatever those motions are, you could be playing an instrument, right? And you want your, you want to have smooth motions. You don't want to have jarring, you know, you can tell a beginner because, because they just, they do not look smooth. It, whatever instrument somebody is playing, you can, you can spot the beginner. You don't even have to hear the answer. You can just look at the hand, man, that thing is like not smooth. You know, just watch a guitar player who's who's just starting and like, ah, I relax a little, you know, and and all of those those motor patterns get mapped in with sleep. If you're not sleeping, you can't do it. So musicians really need a lot of sleep. There's famous stories of songs written in sleep. So this is uh, the deep sleep. Um, the non REM deep sleep is when you're you're you are ingraining those those motor pathways. So that's really critical sleep for athletes. But um, REM, there's there's a lot of the creativity and and um, kind of synaptogenesis type of of oh what's over here oh what about this like sort of that that creativity stuff. And Keith Richards tells a really good story. I don't know if you can see my bookshelf behind me somewhere. It's Keith Richards' book Life, kind of pompously titled, named after the cereal. Oh, there it is. Um, but anyway, so he, he tells a story uh, that he used to record. He'd wake up in the night and record. And I do this for, for my writing where I'll just, I'll dictate or type or something in the night if I have an idea. If I wake up from um, REM sleep is usually when I'm having you know, ideas. Now I'll write them down because I'll have no idea. It's like keeping a dream journal. You have no idea what that was in the morning if you don't write it down. Although if you do write it down, you don't need to have written it down in the morning because you remember exactly what it was because you wrote it down. Um, Anyway, so Keith Richards has a story. Yeah, that's Rolling Stones. He's a guitar player from Rolling Stones. I've never liked the Rolling Stones, but but the book was wonderful. And um, he recorded in the night, and he said, what the hell is this? And he's listening through this tape. And it's like, there's nothing here. It's just me snoring the whole time. And then he hears some, like, you know, cluttering noises and stuff. And then, like, his most famous riff of all time. Uh, from from the Rolling Stones get, gets played. I think it's like I can't get no satisfaction or something. What, what, look up the story. L look up the story. But it's uh, he wrote the thing you know, in his sleep. There's a creativity that's going to come there. And if you're denying yourself that portion of sleep, Paul McCartney has a similar story um, with you know melodies that come in in, in sleep and, and that sort of creative space. Uh, but for the most part, these these athletic and, and musical. Uh, improvements, um, the techniques, things like that are going to be non-REM deep sleep. Okay. Um, preamble aside, let's talk about strategies, the recommendations uh, of what to do. Now, recommendation number one that is so critical that nothing else matters. If you can't do this one, don't even bother with anything else. Um, this is number one by a lot. And that is light. Okay, light. Remember, we are a diurnal species and there is variation. There is circadian variation in our diurnal nature. But we have inhabited, I, you know, whatever, even like whatever your belief system is. I'm no part of what I'm saying is, is coming in like a, a, you know, mocking tone or anything. Uh, whatever your belief system is. Okay, the world was, was invented in 4004 BC. Fine. Okay, the world is billions of years old, and and life was all aquatic once in a, uh, upon a time, and and you know we, we see relics and the recurrent laryngeal nerve that used to go to gills or whatever. Fine, whatever your belief system is, it doesn't matter because the truth is every single moment of human life has been on our planet. Every ancestor you've ever had, every relative who has ever existed, every bipedal humanoid thing that has ever opened its eyes saw a rising sun and a setting sun. And that's what we timed our clocks to. Now, it is remarkably recent, I mean, spectacularly recent, that we have risen above those circadian necessities. And we have indoor electricity, indoor lighting, we have tablets and, and iPhones and televisions 
this is so recent, you do not have any genetic uh, ability to tolerate this stuff. Evolution could not anticipate the, the advent of Steve Jobs and whoever else, you know, Edison, who, whoever you want to name. Um, we do not have an ability to tolerate this stuff. What happens when we expose ourselves to inappropriate light, light that is not consistent with the environment, with the world, with the universe in which we have inhabited forever? Whenever your forever begins, who cares? That's fine. Begin there. Every single second of existence has been timed by the sun until now. And really, we're just like a couple of generations into this, into this, um, and it's not even worldwide. I mean, there's a certain, I mean, look at the map at night. I look at what countries light up at night. I mean, you don't see North Korea glowing like California, right? You don't see Democratic Republic of the Congo, you know, glowing like, it's not like Seattle. Um, so it depends where you are in the world. But certainly here, we have deviated so drastically and tragically from what our genomes necessitate. And we know the consequences with exercise. We know how this affects us with exercise. Just read the papers about, about well, we are, we are used to uh, an amount of physical activity, a daily dose of physical activity. Our, our genes demand it. If we don't get it, what happens? Cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes. I mean, just this, this constellation of complications that just dots the physiological sky. Endless diseases connected to a lack of physical activity. Guess what else uh, we need? And we need at least as much more. We actually need a lot more. Um, is sleep. And how do we calibrate that? With light. Light is the number one. So if you want to dial in your sleep, you have to do this. There's no other way. There's no pharmacological intervention that can compare, um, that can even begin to address the problem uh, if light is not, is not resolved. So light must come first. Everything else takes a backseat, takes a limo distant backseat to light. Um, now, the type of, so there you go again, just saying, the light is the primary synchronizer, number one. It's the most important thing. But there are times of day that matter more than other times of day. When the sun is in that low solar angle, you're hitting that sunrise. You don't have to get up, you know, while the state is asleep. And I mean, the only people out have been out all night. And then like, oh, here you are awake and it's totally dark out. And you have to watch the first beams hit the horizon. You don't have to do that. But early in the morning, that is the optimal time. That's the optimal time to see uh, light, the light profile, that spectrum, um, those blues that really hit you. But, but it's, it's a profile of light. There's a lot of yellows there, too. The yellows aren't going to do a bunch of melatonin suppression. But, but it's the spectrum that matters. It's the quality of light that matters. Um, in the middle of the day, let's say you wake up at eight or nine o'clock, something like that. You're like, oh, it's noon. I'm going to go outside and take a look at the sky. I, just, I really got to you know, wake myself up. I have some homework. I have some studying. I have some work. I have some writing. I have some music. I have some focus. Whatever it is, I have a sport. Whatever it is you want to go do, you go out. It's noon. You, you look at the sky. You are in the circadian dead zone. And that doesn't do shit for you. Look up at the sky, and nothing happens, right? You're not changing anything. That super chiasmatic nucleus doesn't really care. Are you getting lux energy? Is that helpful to some degree? Sure, sure. But you're not setting your circadian rhythm. You are not reestablishing a healthy circadian rhythm by going outside at noon. Now, if you wake up at 1 p.m., right, you, you, you have Nathaniel's work schedule, and you go out... You, you, you go home, you go to bed, it's light out, you're a day sleeper. Um, and okay, go look at the sky. Go look at the sky when, when you're waking up. You need to get your lux when you're waking up. Um, ideally, though, you'll, you'll be able to look at the sun uh, in that low solar angle when it's at the, at the low spot in the horizon. It's different at sunset. It's a little bit different at sunset. There's evidence you can look at the sun. Um, not don't look at the sun, but you can look at the sky um, in the proximity to the sun and, and it's, it get a little bit of a protective effect. There's a lot of reds. And, and remember, reds don't do much to you. Reds don't really suppress melatonin in the same way that those blues do. Now, 
these studies, I this is from 1993, this stuff isn't new. We've known about this for a long time, but the urge, the need, the emotional necessity of email and Instagram and whatever else, whatever people do online, like memes and stuff, the, the emotional necessity of participating uh, in that ephemeral part of life because none of that matters um but the i mean okay your emails matter if it's like work stuff and and you're like a family uh thing that you're doing or or it's like a relationship that you're managing and and you know he or she is overseas or okay fine yeah it matters but the ephemeral part of like ooh, did you hear about justin bieber's new th well, who gives a shit um do, does this matter the tiniest bit in three days no you don't even remember in three days what does your brain remember that you lost rem sleep that you lost deep sleep and you're never the same that's what your brain remembers the justin bieber thing nobody gives a shit justin bieber doesn't give a shit in three days but when you start working on light training, um, exposure to bright light at particular times, and you can do this indoors. Uh, there are devices you can buy. Um, I, I haven't graded the quality of these things, and I haven't read anybody's work who has. Uh, I used to use one when I had terrible sleeping problems. Um, other than last night, uh, you know, occasionally you will have sporadic bad sleep, even with everything dialed in perfectly, stress profiles, things like that are going to affect it. But um, I used to have this indoor light that I would look at. Um, I was living in Salem and it was like super cloudy. And at that time, I didn't know that even if you go outside and it's cloudy, it's actually better than, than, than these lights. But these things work. I mean, these things totally work. These, these sleep schedules, so sleep efficiency. Remember, 100% sleep efficiency is your, you gave yourself eight hours of sleep opportunity and you slept for all eight, or you gave yourself six hours of sleep opportunity, and you slept for all six. If you give yourself eight hours of sleep opportunity and sleep for four, I mean, that's not even on here. That's a 50%. Um, and so you want to give yourself ample sleep opportunity. But if you if you train with light and you, and you incorporate this stuff, your sleep efficiency improves relatively rapidly. Um, and here's the amount of time people were awake. There's the baseline um, and the amount of wake uh, uh, wakefulness throughout the night compared to the post-treatment. Um, you're just really chopping the amount of wake time uh, in half. And how long does it take? I'm going to suggest, do whatever you want, you know, I mean, all your behaviors and life decisions and beliefs are totally up to you. And, and I have no say in any of them. Um, that's how it should be. But what I would suggest, again, this is Courtney's recommendations, give yourself a week and really try it. If you have sleep, if you don't have sleeping problems and you're, that's the minority, the minority of people, um, a very slender minority don't have sleeping problems. Most people do. Now, whether it's I don't know what full blown means, but wh whether it is ex an extreme case of insomnia or man, I just, ah, I just can't sleep like I want to, you know, th there are, th there's a spectrum here. Um, but if you are on this, how delightful side of the spectrum and you really don't have any, any sleeping problems, that's like people who just have never had back pain. Like, man, you can just like put socks on however you want. If you drop your keys, you, you, you don't freak out. You can like pick them up however you want. You don't, you don't think about like, you know, the people who have back pain, me being one of them, I have three herniated discs in my back. Um, people who have back pain, you see the world a little bit differently. You see it a little bit bitterly. Um, there's a little bit of envy for people who, who tie their shoes. You know, I might have just tied all the time because like, man, I, that's a lot of pain. I, I don't want to go through that. Um, and it's the same thing for people who have sleeping problems. You, you see the world a little bit differently. But how long does it take? Well, here's a study from 2017. Fucking go camping. Spend a weekend camping and time your exposure as though you're living in Cameroon. Time it like you're in a part of the world that is still belongs to the world. A part of the world um, that is still companionable with mother nature. Camping and you're gonna see improvement. But I would suggest try it for a week because again, there are, uh, there's a spectrum here and some people are, are so far off the wagon that like it's gonna take time to catch up to that thing. You know, and some people, are, it's like finals week or it's work stuff and it's stress and, and it's, it's family crises. And, and, and these situations can really affect our ability to, to adapt, our ability to, um, 
uh, I don't know, adopt a new circadian rhythm, a new healthier circadian rhythm. So while you can do it in a week of a weekend of camping, I would suggest a week of actual effort uh, uh, put forward. Now, here's I'm shouting these ones because these ones are important. Uh, if you see my side profile shouting, that means this is like top tier. You cannot do without this and still uh, remedy insomnia or sleeping problems or wherever you reside on the spectrum. If, if you see you know, the exclamation point um, coming out of my mouth before the words do and the, like the huge, um, was that the platysma or something? The muscles are, um, if you see this, uh, this means uh, you, you can't you can't do without this one. There's some where it's just me being calm, saying this is helpful stuff. But this one you you can't you can't give this up and then pretend to be trying. Um, morning sun. Now morning is going to be different for us. Morning for everyone here is going to be slightly different because we're all slightly different. Uh, morning for me is probably going to be the earliest um, of everybody here. I get up before the sun rises um, and then I go look at the sun directly at it, I, I'm blind now. Um, and then for some people, your schedule is going to be a little bit later. Figuring out exactly what your circadian rhythm is is sort of part of the, what I would say, the challenge or my, not the charge, that seems a little bit aggressive, but, but what I would suggest um, that you would do if you have uh, sleeping problems, that sort of, um, my request that you do these things for your own health and well-being and happiness and satisfaction, whatever. Uh, morning sun. What does that mean? Aim for 100,000 lux by nine. Well, I just go outside for 10 minutes. Go outside and stand in a sunny patch and yawn a little. Get Take some deep breathing. Do a little yoga outside. Do some walking. Take the trash out. JP, go catch that cat that had the bag on his head. Um, do whatever. Go outside for a little bit and do and do stuff. Sometimes I'll just like take the trash out and I'll just stand by the trash. Oh, it's so nice out here. I'm like standing by the trash bin because that's where the sun shines brightest in, at my house in the morning. Um, do that now it, again. If you if you wake up at seven or eight o'clock or something, you go at like eleven or noon or something. Ah, you're you're in a circadian dead zone. This isn't helpful. Um, that's that's like. When when student when, like, when a semester is over and grades are submitted, and I guarantee this is going to happen to me this semester, not from you guys, but from from undergrads, I always get this. What can I do for extra credit? Well, the semester ended three days ago. Uh, do you know how much paperwork there would be? I mean, I would it would take me like six hours to assign you a point of extra credit. What are you talking about? What you can do for extra credit is you know, I don't know, get in the DeLorean and, and I'll see you three months ago. And, but um, it's the same thing here where, you know, you wake up and you, and you don't do it during the period that works. When the sun is low in the sky and you haven't been awake for very long, you're going to try to emerge from bed in the most effective way possible. Oh, later in the day, I'll get up and do it. That's not helpful. That's asking for extra credit when, when uh, the semester is over. That's the circadian dead zone. Now, as a general rule, a very general rule, get some lux in those eyes when your temperature is on the rise. Avoid a lot of lux when your temperature is on the decline. The world will do this for you, but we don't live in that world. We live indoors, there are lights everywhere. Everything is, is invading our eyeballs, our eye space, our visual you know, hemispheres are, are constantly being assaulted by unnatural light. And that's fine. We're not going to go back to a time in which oh, I'm reading the comment box. Good. The cat, the cat is bagless. That's good news. That's good news for the feline community. Um, when our temperature is on the rise, that's the optimal time to fill up our eyes with those lux. When we, you know, maybe 11 hours after you wake up, something like that, let's say halfway between the time you wake up and go to bed, somewhere around there, you know, maybe not quite half. It, your temperature minimum might be a couple of hours. Remember, it's a princess bride before you wake up. Um, it's you know, 10, 11, maybe 12 hours, something like that. After you wake, after you wake up, you're going to have your, your temperature max. Once you cross that and you're on the descent, you're on the decline, your, your core temperature is, is dwindling a little bit, now's the time to allow the world's light to start withdrawing. 
that's the best way of doing it. And man, is this important. I mean, exclamation point, I'm yelling, I'm yelling, you got to do that part. Now, here's another thing that is behaviorally uh, on the, on, you know, teetering on critical. Once quarantine happened, people just started working from bed. And this is something I, this is one of the behaviors I used to do, you know, in my, 20s, I guess I did it, uh, that I would just laptop and I'm working from bed. I'm reclined, working from bed. But in the age of quarantine, we're all sort of trapped indoors and people don't have the same out of the house structure. So if you look at, now I don't know how reliable this tuck.com's survey, I'm assuming this is somewhere close to true. And what they found was 72% of people report working from bed, um, up from 50% before COVID-19. And so I don't know, you know how accurate what their sampling was, you know, is, is this representative sampling? Does this describe you? How did they recruit? I don't know how they, how they did all this stuff. So don't take this 72% as, oh, this is the exact number. Take it as a, as a trend uh, where maybe 20% more uh, people are now working from bed. Now, what's the problem with working from bed? Associations associations of you go to bed if you read any of these sleep articles and sleep books and I've read a few of the books and uh, an enormous number of articles and one of the and you know I've, I've worked with sleep specialists and one of the consistent pieces of advice which I have a slight problem with I, I find it sort of Silly, but I, I get what they do. They, they say, and it's, it's a cliche for sleep advice. They say, the bedroom, the only two activities you can do in the bedroom are sleep and sex. Nothing else. Nothing belongs in the bedroom. Can you get dressed there? Sure. Um, you know, can you like, oh, I got to go. I store something in my sock drawer. I got to go in the bedroom to, to get this thing out of my sock. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, but so that's what they say, because we build these associations where when I used to work from bed, I would get into bed and the anxiety of work would just strike me fierce, right? I, I, I would just immediately, it's the context. You know, if somebody has PTSD, now this is an extreme case. And remember PTSD, if, if we can get people to get into those dream states that REM sleep, there's a lot of emotional processing you're going to see. And there seems to be a lot of, of therapeutic uh, potential for for treatment of, of PTSD um, in, in increasing REM uh, sleep. So there's processing of those emotions. But PTSD, if you, let's say, let's just go extreme and say it's war, right? You, you are, it's military and you hear bullets. You know, a car drives by and backfires. And what happens? You, like, you pass out, right? You, you, you like you collapse and you're gasping for air. Or all that was was a car or a driver. You know, we build these associations. Now, as I'm talking about, okay, here's here's one. I um, I once uh, I was at a doctor's office and I passed out, and I don't know why I did. I was a teenager. Um, I had a bunch of blood drawn, and I think I was like 16 or something. And then I don't know if I was. I don't know, my blood sugar was low. I locked my knees. I don't know what it was because I'm 40 and this, I was like 16 at the time. And I'm looking at this wall of newborn babies. I'm bored. I'm, I'm waiting to be discharged or whatever. I'm looking at this. I'm just, as all 16 year olds are, forever and ever and ever bored. And I'm looking at this wall, at this little, like, little babies, like here's little Juniper and here's, you know, Olivia and here's, and just going through all these names and looking at these little kids, they all look identical, whatever. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm waking up with people standing over me. Um, and there's like a doctor over me with an oxygen mask. And like, I, I don't know what the hell happened. I, I passed out. I, I must have smashed my head really hard when I did. And who knows why the next time I was at that clinic, let's say I was 17, 18, something like that. The wall of babies was still there. I went up and I, it, I didn't even, two days late, as all 16 year olds can, you just forget about it immediately. 
I, who cares? Nothing matters in the world, right? If my, my childhood was really good, I had this like amazing, you know, little boyhood in Salem. And so what could possibly upset me? Nothing. I forgot everything. And the whole world was wonderful always. And I go to the you know, doctor's office again. And I'm waiting for this. I'm like in the lobby waiting or something. I see that wall. I have not thought about this wall in like two years. I see it. My knees buckled and I almost passed out. Why? It didn't even occur to me what happened at the time. I'm like, oh my God, I have this like this weird PTSD thing where I saw this wall and it brought me back. My knees buckled and I, and like to, to this day, I probably hate baby pictures. I don't know. Um, but we, we build associations with things. Right, there are associations. It's a smell. It's a oh, that's that song brings me back. I feel like I'm right there today. You know, it's back in high school or whatever. You hear a song. It's a smell. Right, there was a there's this in Bond Fitness Center. Somebody wore, you know, my seventh grade girlfriend's perfume. I have no idea what this stuff smells like. I haven't thought about this since the seventh grade. I didn't even think about it in the seventh grade. Again, I was bored by everything in the seventh grade. And I was at Bond Fitness Center. I'm like, whoa, I'm a middle schooler. What the hell? What is happening? We build associations. And we do the same thing. If you bring work to bed, guess what happens when you're in bed? You think about nothing but work. What do you need to do to fall asleep? You need to shut your brain down. You need to stop thinking all the time. You need GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, inhibitory neurotransmitter, to do its deed. You, you need to be... Um, uh, become lethargic, put those thoughts aside and surrender to sleep. If you work from bed, terrible. Now, that advice that every, it's a cliche. The only two things you can do in bed are, are sleep and sex. Why does sex get a pass? Get another bed, right? have a guest room, have a sofa, have a floor, do whatever. It, that, it makes no sense why that should be in there other than they don't want to have the follow-up conversation. Well, what about, they don't want to have that conversation. But if we're being honest, if you build the only association you have with your bed is when I'm in there, I'm asleep, man, you're going to sleep so much better when you're in that room. So try not to build inappropriate associations with it. Uh, never, ever screens in the bedroom. Don't bring, now I violate this. I, I, I my, <clears throat> Because I'll put on like Audible or or meditation apps when, when I'm in bed. So this is this is when I, I violate as as softly as I can. Um, I have the the brightness turned all the way down, and I'll usually have blue blockers on at this time. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and I like squint. I like squint at my phone, and I like hold it at a different angle um, to start the meditation app, or or you know I'll put on Audible with it with a timer on it, something like that. But this is one that you should really try to manage the best you can. If you lie in bed, and I would just endless studies here, and they all say the exact same thing, with varying p values and varying magnitudes, they all have the exact same story. If you bring screens to bed, good luck sleeping. I mean, it's really, this just, melatonin is nowhere to be found if, if you're looking into, especially if you're looking at a screen and there's work on that screen, melatonin wants nothing to do with it. Melatonin broke up with you and didn't even write you a letter. They just like ghosted you. That's what melatonin does to you. If, if you bring screens to bed, and especially if there's work or something stressful or something otherwise agitating uh, on that screen. So try not to do that one. The blue blockers, don't use blue blockers in the morning. Don't use blue blockers in the late morning, at noon, in the early afternoon. When your temperature is on the decline, when, you're, when your core temperature is falling, and you don't need to measure your temperature, but just when the sun is going down, you know, you've been awake for a dozen hours, you know, I don't know what time you wake up, but, but let's say it's six o'clock, it's seven o'clock, the sun's going down, throw on the blue blockers if you're going to be watching TV or something. I do. Um, there's like three pairs of these things all over. So depending on what room I'm in, there's one right there, whatever, there's just one in proximity. Um, oh, there's another one. There's another pair. I think my third pair is on that. So uh, they're, they're just sitting all over the house. So, so then I remember because look, I don't wear glasses and I don't remember to put shit on my face. Um, but at night, you know, the TV is on or the computer is on or, or, or my phone or something like that. There's a screen, even if there's just light in the house, overhead lights in the house, I'll put them on when it's getting dark outside. I'll put on the blue blockers. Do not put these on earlier. Um, 
you're going to get some blue light from your computer. You're going to get some blue light from the sky. You're going to get some blue light from your bedside lamp. You're going to get some blue light from your phone. And that's fine when your temperature is on the rise. That's fine uh, in the morning. That's fine when you're trying to be alert. When you're trying to permit the pineal gland to do its duty, get try to get rid of those blue lights. And in the house, if you can install red lights, do that. Install red lights. Oh, nighttime switch. Let's toggle that thing. Um, you know, we're like floor lights that are red. Yellow isn't bad, but, but lights that look yellow. I mean, there's just like a full spectrum in there. So that's the blue blockers. Now, this is obvious. If, you, if you're living with like a woodpecker in your bedroom or something making noise or, or like your roommate loves you know, Megadeth and you just can't turn it down. Like it is down. Well, you know, okay. You're going to have disrupted sleep. If you live in Manhattan, right? The sound of cars, uh, you're, there's going to be potential disruptions of sleep. Now, sometimes if it's consistent noise, if it's New York, right? It's consistent noise all the time. That's not as bad. Uh, if it is bursts of noise that are inconsistent, that's going to keep you up, right? There's lots of data on this. And it's just obvious. We, we don't need to explain this uh, farther. But what's which is why this is like, you know, mellow Courtney. And it's just a little thought bubble saying, hey, be mindful of your habitat and its noise pollution, the quality of your habitat. Um, you know, it's like, oh, it's just there's like, they're jackhammering outside and it smells like sulfur in here. I mean, like, okay, you're gonna have troubles sleeping in that situation, but we've known about this for a really long time. I, I could put more recent literature here, uh, but let's let's go with some, some old studies. And it's a good one to make a comparison of the effects of noise and temperature. People think that jackhammer is, is worse. It's not, because it's not as biological. The wor world has had noise for a really long time. Um, we pay attention to noise. We, we acknowledge it, the wind in the trees, and or if it's like a big roar, if it's like a lion roaring, obviously we're gonna be alerted out of, out of sleep pretty quickly, but you know, birds are flapping around. And I mean, it's just stuff that noise is a thing. It's, it, we're capable of sleeping through that. Temperature though, if we have disruptions of temperature, that disrupts our sleep more than noise. So temperature is number two. Light is number one. Very, very biological. I mean, that thing has been on time to work. The sun has. It has been on time to work every day of its life, which you know precedes every day of every creature's life. That sun has been to work on time, punches in right on schedule, clocks out at the exact second it's supposed to. Ah, oh, that thing. That is a reliable uh, biological cue. And so we rely on it so heavily. So we just lean on that sun's shoulder uh, to regulate our sleep. But uh, temperature, that's our, that's our runner up. Temperature is our runner up. And I, I, I'm not shouting here. Maybe I should have, maybe I should be shouting. I, I decided not to raise my voice with this slide. Uh, if you keep your house, 68 degrees, 66, 69, 70, 72. Oh, I just get cold all the time. I, uh, I have Reno syndrome or what, you know, I keep it 85 degrees. Well, okay, whatever. Um, so if whatever you keep your house, drop it, drop it when the climate starts falling, when the outdoor air begins to cool. Now that's not like four o'clock. But you know, you hit six o'clock, seven o'clock, start to cool the house down a little bit or the apartment or whatever. If you're living in a tent, that's fine. Just don't have like a fire going. Uh, allow the temperature of your house or your living quarters to, or at least your bedroom to mimic the patterns of outdoor air. And if you just drop it to about 65, that's fine. That, that seems to be an ideal temperature, somewhere around 65. Maybe for you it's 64, maybe for you it's 62, maybe for you it's 66, I don't know, something like that. But drop it, drop the temperature at night so your body understands the cue of, oh, that's right, now is the time to transition into a lowering uh, core temperature, which prepares me for sleep. Um, that sets the, the slumber timer. Now there's an interesting phenomenon. Again, if you go to, if it's like 31 degree, when I was living in Connecticut, I was so poor that I couldn't even like, I didn't even have my fridge plugged in. Um, 
which it didn't matter because my apartment was 30 degrees, I would have a glass of water next to my bed, which I, the worst decision, I had an inflatable mattress. The air in that inflatable mattress, you don't warm it up with your body. And, and I had like one blanket. And so I'm lying on this inflatable mattress and the air is like 30 degrees beneath me. I'm shivering all night. That was not helpful. I, my, my sleep was not going well when I was in Connecticut for the first year that I was there. Then I had enough money. Like, okay, now I'm going to get a bed. And although I got my um, bed frame from the local dump, I'm like, oh, that looks good. That, that looks okay. I'll just squirt that with some Lysol. Um, and then I bought a, a mattress to suit. Uh, so the glass, I would have water all the time and the glass overnight would freeze. Wake up in the morning, you know, try to drink what was in my glass and it's frozen solid. That's not helpful. That doesn't help you sleep. But I think everybody here has the financial means to regulate their climate a little bit. Um, and the optimal way of doing so is, let's just say it's 70 degrees uh, for the day drop it about five degrees at night. But showers, cold showers, hot showers, this has a counterintuitive response. So people think, oh, I'm gonna take a hot shower and warm up for bed. Not true. What you, what you end up doing is getting this rebound effect where your, your core temperature actually cools. So showering before bed doesn't warm you up. It actually cools you down. While you're standing in the shower, that particular tissue is going to be a little bit warm. Fine. Sure. Yes, there's local temperature increases where the hot water is hitting. But you get out of the shower and 10 minutes later, are you still warmed by that shower? No, your core temperature is falling a little bit. So showering before bed, your, your body doesn't care how hygienic you are when you lie down for sleep, to the best of my knowledge. Maybe it does. Maybe in a few years we'll find out, ooh, there's a bacterial thing that really has an effect. All right, yeah, I don't, I'm unfamiliar with that. I think the state of evidence is, is, um, has not indicated that that has anything to do with, with sleep pressure or efficiency or anything like that. What seems to be um, the, the major cues in the literature, and we've been studying this for a long time, light and temperature, and a shower is going to reduce. So don't even use soap, that's fine. <laughs> Just get in there and come out all stinky and get into bed, that's fine too unless you're sleeping next to somebody, then, then they may object. A cold shower, an ice bath, you're gonna get a rebound effect that's gonna warm you up. Now, not if you get like hypothermia and you have problems. It's, okay, this is a little bit different. But in the morning, if you take like an icy shower, an ice bath, you're gonna get a rebound uh, thermal increase. And so you can accelerate this increase in core temperature uh, by doing that. And so using these strategies of warming yourself up and cooling yourself down to augment your body's natural uh, inclination of, of weather temperature is rising, weather temperature is falling, working with those trends. Now, if you exercise late at night, uh, if, you, if, it's, if you go to bed at 10 and you exercise at eight, ah, uh, yeah, there's a lot of core temperature rising that's happening there. You're sort of getting mixed signals. You're giving your body mixed signals. But if it's in the morning, if it's in the morning and you're having your cortisol response, cortisol is getting you out of bed. Maybe you're exercising, say, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, something like that after you wake up great time to exercise. You're probably going to be good at it. You're probably going to be alert. Um, you might not be at your strongest point, but you're probably going to be pretty alert and, and eager to exercise, and you're going to encourage the climbing of your core temperature. A few hours later, yeah, that temperature is really going to be escalating. That temperature is, is going to be having a pretty steep increase. Great time to exercise. Great time to exercise to augment that curve. You're probably going to be focused when your temperature is at its peak. When your temperature is at its peak, ah, you're going to perform well. You're still going to be alert, and, and, and there's going to be a, a good performance going there. Those are good times to exercise. 8.30 p.m. Oh, shit, I was busy all day. I didn't exercise. Let me just bang out a few sets before bed. That's not helpful. 
that's that's moving in the in the wrong direction for your core temperature and so make sure you incorporate exercise at optimal times now it's hard uh there'll be i want to exercise about six days a week i get to exercise uh maybe three days a week something like that because i'm still at this point where i'm getting between 30 and 40 hours of requests for my time every day and i get overwhelmed and sometimes i just have to sit there and it's just deadline after deadline after deadline and i have to just type and type and type um, and I try to manage things like light and temperature the best I can uh, so I can sleep that night. I try to manage stress, you know, bring a little meditation app to bed uh, or non-sleep deep rest protocol, something like that. So I can try to shed uh, the work stress and, and the focus so I don't just go work, 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 sleep, because that's a hard transition to make. Um, I mean, that's like shuttle run, change directions completely. You're going to sprain a cognitive ankle if you're changing directions that hard. So uh, I try to exercise and, and sometimes it's at night. It's like at seven o'clock. Man, I just, oh, I'll, let me just do like, I'll try to activate a couple of high threshold motor units without actually raising my body temperature. I, I'm not even going to elevate my breathing here. I'm just going to lift something heavy a couple of times just to expose tissue electrically. You know, I try to come up with little strategies of, of not wasting away uh, to work demands while, um, uh, without interrupting my uh, circadian uh, thermal regulation. But if you know these mechanisms, if you know how this stuff works, if you know how these, these behaviors influence your sleep, you get to make manipulations that are optimal, uh, no matter what your schedule presents. So your schedule is like, oh man, my mornings are terrible or whatever. Well, maybe I'll just get up super early to exercise. Well, consider the implications. Like, oh, during the day, it's, it's really rough. I'm just gonna exercise before bed. Consider the, imp the implications there and, and, and try to structure your day the best you can. Now, uh, the workforce and, and scholastic uh, demands, these things don't always, they're not lenient. They're lenient with health. Uh, I mean, neither is like healthy food is super expensive. I mean, look at the rising cost of go get like organic produce or whatever and compare that to Ritz. And, and the, the cost differences in you know, eating like a slob compared to eating like somebody who just values the shit out of your body. Oh, the value is so expensive. Um, and so life, society is not really set up for health in many capacities, whether it's exercise or nutrition or anything, but knowing how these things affect us, knowing how these things will influence um, our sleep hygiene, sleep health, sleep, our ability to, to slumber silently and soundly and um, that allows you to make the best decisions that you can. Now, consistency of behavior. This is number three. I would say light is number one, temperature is number two, and consistency is number three. And these are just my rankings. It's not, you're not going to look in the literature. I mean, light is number one. <laughs> yeah, I, we all sort of agree on that. Um, temperature, reasonable to say that's number two is temperature. And I, it's reasonable to say this is this is number three, but this is my ranking. Um, but consistency, there's a lot of support in the literature that let's say you can't get um, eight hours of sleep every night. It's actually, if you're just consistently getting your six and a half, consistently getting your seven, it doesn't seem to do as much harm as if you're averaging six and a half or averaging seven, but your sleep is up and down. You, know, you get eight and then five and then nine and then four and then whatever. You know, if you're up and down and up and down, that uh, harms your your sleep and your health more than does consistency with a lower uh, net amount of sleep. Now, some of these studies, this one on the left over here, um, this one, it's looking at these irregular, you know, sleep-wake patterns. If you're, well, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I, I mean, this is, you know, Nathaniel, uh, you know your schedule of, of how uh, adjusting might be difficult on, on days when it's like, oh, okay, it's work, 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 uh, you know, daytime, 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 night, 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 daytime, 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 where these schedules get a little bit inconsistent. Uh, but we all are going to have demands in life, uh, whether it is uh, family stresses, scholastic work, anything. It, 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 we can't be perfectly consistent. But if, even on weekends, 
you get out of bed at the exact same time ish and you go to bed at the exact same time ish on monday on wednesday on saturday on christmas on new year's whatever okay make an exception for new year's if you're like if that's your thing whatever but if you are very consistent that is a critical part of of getting adequate sleep um, and having your body prepare itself you can see the same thing with nutrition uh if you eat very um non-religiously religiously figuratively religiously it's like okay at noon precisely i eat every day okay like 11 55 a.m you're gonna get some hunger pangs you know there's gonna be you know, if you which is why if you're eating in the middle of the night you're you, you may be um, roused from slumber uh, to go feed yourself. You may experience um, kind of hunger and an urge to eat in the middle of the night if you um, structure your diet that way. So consistency is very important. Um, if you go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time every day, that's what I do. Yeah, I, some nights are still going to be bad sleep, but um, I, my sleep opportunity, I am, I am, um, furious about interruptions in my sleep opportunity and the consistency of that schedule, give or take half an hour or 45 minutes, something like that. Um, less important points, uh, go to bed when you're tired, when you're sleepy, when you're ready for bed. Uh, now this sort of contradicts some of the other stuff, but what's difficult is going to bed when you're not tired and then be like, oh, let me just will myself to sleep. I just put my mind to it. Because remember, the sympathetic nervous system is so easy to um, activate. It's so easy to um, emphasize. The parasympathetic nervous system, you can't force it. You, you, you can't force it. Um, it's like peeing. You just relax to let it out. You know, if you if you get stage fright or something like, okay, let's everyone go pee in the trough, you know, and we all line up to go pee in the trough and people get this sympathetic nervous system response. Um, I remember be, I go into like a Seattle Seahawks game when I was like 12 years old and there was like a urinary trough. It was like 75 people peeing at the same time and I'm like 12 years old and I go up and I was like, I stand there for 30 seconds. Like, how do I pee? I, I don't know how to pee. I'm, I'm trying. I mean, I am just... I, <laughs> I'm like pushing and grunting and like nothing's coming out because you got to relax. You got to relax to let it's not, hopefully it's not shit out, but to let that, you know, let your bladder do its, do its, um, diuresis. Uh, and it's the same thing with, with sleep. Yeah. It's, you, you can't force it. You, you can't force it. Um, and if you go to bed and you're not tired, yeah, you're, you're going to build an association with, bed my bedroom the bed is the place where i lie and fail to sleep and you're going to build that association you want to be able to sleep when you're in there so if you're if you're unable to sleep if it's the middle of the night and you're unable to sleep i have two beds uh in the house and if i'm unable to sleep it's like I, if it's like half an hour 45 minutes go by and i'm, I'm unable to sleep i'll leave I, I don't want to build an association with me lying down in a bed and it's like here's the place where i where I lie here and stare for five hours straight. You know, I, I don't want to build that association. So I get up and I leave. Um, now what I'm not going to do is shine a bunch of light in my face. I don't want to have dopamine problems the next day. I don't want to have uh, sleep disturbances and, and circadian rhythm disturbances. Um, what I want to do is go somewhere peaceful and relaxing. And, and I have another bed that I, that I go to that's like, I can lie in that bed. I, I actually don't mind working from that bed. Sometimes I do that. Um, but that's my utility bed. That's like everything else happens in that bed. And I, I will go there and I'll put on like a meditation app or something. I'll usually fall asleep in, the, in that bed. That room is actually colder too. Um, the AC just blows like fierce in, in that room. Um, alarm clocks. Avoid alarm clocks if you can. Uh, now, you probably can't because you have classes at specific times. You have to be at work at a specific time. And if you sleep through that, you lose your job. And if you lose your job, you can't afford, you know, climate control and, and food and stuff. So, so use alarm clocks, I, I would say sparingly, if, if, you, if you can wake up without it, if you can dial in your circadian rhythm without it. And remember there are 
Um, oh, there are ways like you, you can use a Fitbit and it'll vibrate you when you're in light sleep or something like that. That's a pretty effective way of getting out of bed, but, but eh, eh, like that thing, I mean, there are some insane alarm clocks, Google, um, like most violent alarm clocks. So there's, there's like crazy stuff. Um, but the worst thing you can do for your, for your health, probably in the bedroom with the exception of you know, drugs or, or whatever is the snooze button. I mean, this is one of the cruelest inventions of modern society. Um, in part, what you're doing is devastating your REM sleep. Those are the hours when you get REM sleep. So you can fall back to sleep after you hit snooze and like seven minutes go by. And we talked about this where, where during those seven minutes, you like leap back into a dream. You bring yourself back into a dream state pretty rapidly. And you get this time dilation. You have no idea how long you've been asleep. So there's this, you're probably replaying things very slowly. There's some mouse studies. You go have them do a maze and, and they'll replay that maze in slow-mo, um, you know, as they're, as they're going into dream sleep. And, and, but we, people too, we get this time dilation and then eh, eh, it wakes you up again. Every time that happens, um, you get cardiovascular distress, right? There's, there is, um, a cardiovascular response that is nowhere near healthy. Uh, and you, you just repeatedly subject yourself to that cardiovascular stress, and you repeatedly subject yourself to disruptions, to fragmentation, to disruptions of REM sleep. So you're compromising your sleep, you're compromising brain health, and you're compromising cardiovascular health, and you're doing it repeatedly for what reason? You're going to get out of bed at the exact same time anyway. Just set your alarm if you need one, if you need an alarm, um, set it at the time that you're actually going to get out of bed, and your brain will be healthier and your heart will be healthier. So try to avoid alarm clocks if you can, but man, this is insane. The snooze button is one of the cruelest inventions we have. Now, uh, Diet, talking about dietary interventions, nutritional strategies, this is hard to say because the data are so conflicted. Um, you can f sort of find support for anything, what whatever diet you want, um, whatever your uh, nutritional tendencies are, you could probably search long enough and say, oh, I found something that supports me because the the findings here are so diverse. Now, a couple of things are pretty consistent. One of them is you shouldn't go to bed starving. You shouldn't be, you know, starve implies, you know, there's a direction toward death, but, but uh, a ravenous appetite you haven't eaten in a long time, there, there's food deprivation happening, that sort of situation. You're going to get a lot of ghrelin, um, orexin, hypocretin, this stuff, what you're going to get is food seeking behaviors. You're going to be agitated. You're, you're going to be animated. You want to get out of bed and go get food. It's hard to sleep in the presence of orexin, hypocretin, ghrelin, um, in, in, in the presence of these. It is difficult to fall asleep. Now, short-term fasting, I fast every Sunday. Uh, and those are the, my best nights of sleep is that Sunday. I've never fasted for two days because I don't really like the literature. Um, I get what some of the literature says about it. Um, uh, but it gets a little bit more complicated um, when you're looking at, you know, like, like, oh, growth hormone comes up. Yeah, okay. But what, you know, let's look at IGF and let, let's, it's a bigger picture. Um, so I don't necessarily like this, the, the literature, the full picture of literature when people are doing these longer fasts, but I'll do it for um, every Sunday, you know, it's 33 to 36 hours. It depends when I get, go into bed and get out of bed. Um, and I sleep well. On, on those nights, I always sleep very well. Uh, my hunch is I would sleep very poorly if I continued the, the fast. And some people are responders, non-responders. There's going to be diversity in your response, but going to bed super hungry doesn't seem to help people sleep. Um, I sleep okay, but that's, I'm, that's an N of one. Now, the, here's a study that says, you know, these low carbohydrate diets may help um, this is slow wave sleep. So we're thinking um, non-REM deep sleep for this one, um, but sort of moving some REM to, to deep sleep. Diets, the only reason I have this slide up is to say <sighs> macronutrient profiles, studies exist. 
that show differences in sleep quality, sleep quantity, sleep efficiency, um, the stages, those ultradian cycles, data exist. But they're, they're inconsistent, and I wouldn't put too much faith into any one finding for these things. Now, what is consistent? Going to bed super hungry repeatedly uh, uh, among the most people seems to impair sleep owing to orexin hypocretin, or owing to ghrelin, owing to food seeking behaviors, owing to your hypothalamus saying, I have the munchies, you better do something about it. Number two, don't overdo carbs. Uh, carbs seem to be fine uh, in, in some dose. Yeah, you don't need to go keto to be able to sleep. 70% um, or higher for carbohydrate, especially if there's a bunch of sugar, that seems to be more consistently disruptive uh, to sleep. So I wouldn't be super carbohydrate-y and I wouldn't go to bed super hungry. Other than that, you have a lot of freedom in your nutrition to not impair sleep is the state of evidence that, that, um, that I understand. Now, alcohol, all collegiate, um, anyone who's endured college and all of you have gone through undergrad and alcohol is almost an inherent part of the experience. I mean, that's like alcohol 101 is, should be like, actually should be a class. What we really should be teaching is stuff like sleep and alcohol and drugs, and like interesting things. Here, here's the physiology of all of these things. And let's talk, you know, bio, you know, 51, alcohol. I mean, that's, people would be showing up and they'd be interested in the body and, and biology and science, um, if that's what we were doing. Now, you remember when we were talking about alcohol and alcohol dehydrogenase, right? We get acetaldehyde. Now, these aldehydes seem to impair REM sleep. If you have these in your system, REM sleep gets impaired. And this is potentially problematic. Uh, drinking once in a while, that's okay. But here's a solution. For, I guess a solution is like, don't drink. That's not a thing. That's not a solution, right? Now, a solution for light is like, be a maniac with it. Be the furor of, of light. That you really should do that. With alcohol, go have your wine, go have your rum, go have your, go have your stuff. It's actually better to drink in the morning. People are going to frown upon this. Man, you're a morning drinker, right? Or it's like a Bloody Mary because they're, they're like hungover and they think this is helpful. Uh, but there, there's a, I don't know, a stigma or stereotype or, or something about people who are you know, pouring their first glass of wine as 9 a.m. Like, man, what a drunkard. That's better, actually, uh, because you can metabolize that and you'll probably be, no, I haven't seen the exact literature on this stuff, but if, the, if your blood alcohol content is high, if you have um, you know, acetaldehyde, these things, you're going to impair your REM sleep. So, so morning drinking, is better for your brain than evening drinking because that alcohol is going to last a long time. Your sleep's going to be impaired. I'm not saying don't don't drink, but time it. You know, go when the sun is when the sun is up. Go go have your drink, and then I would stop when when the temperature is going down. I'd, I'd try not to have that uh, that bottle in your mouth anymore. Uh, naps. There, there's a lot of debates on on naps, but not really in the scientific literature. There are debates on naps and and sort of friend and foe of nap on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and stuff. Oh, you're you know, live a shorter life if you nap and whatever. Okay, okay. Let's actually look at the real scientific literature. Naps are great. Okay, I don't take naps, but uh, in the midday. We do. There's a lot of like, look at cultures who once took their little siestas and uh, whether you're in Greece, wherever you are, and we're purging these things, society is getting on this napless uh, tendency. And if you follow these these trends epidemiologically, you see a very strong relationship with with, you know, things like heart attacks, uh, myocardial infarctions, heart attacks. Um, but if you just look at the neuroscience here, if you nap, 
in the midday or do non-sleep deep rest, sort of a meditation uh, in the middle of the day, call it noon, you know, whatever, two o'clock, one o'clock, it depends on your circadian rhythm. Um, you will secure what you've already learned in the morning more effectively. You will enhance the learning of what you've already done. And there are studies that show improvements in subsequent learning by roughly 20%. Um, a, a considerable improvement in your brain activity following the nap. So your afternoon learning, your brain isn't just toast anymore. You get to use it for the rest of the day. Uh, and as long as that nap is say 20 minutes, under 30 minutes, something like that, um, or that's the duration of your meditation or non-sleep deep rest protocol. Uh, if, if you're looking at that 20, 25 minutes, something like that, super effective, healthful, not gonna disrupt, unlikely rather to disrupt your evening sleep. Uh, pay attention if you're, if you're taking naps and like oh, on days when I take a nap, I, I don't sleep at all. Well, you're not gonna sleep that night if you, if you nap for like an hour and a half. Um, if you hit deep sleep, uh, this is, you know, you're getting into like REM and deep sleep. That means you're sleep deprived. That means your, your nighttime sleep is a mess and you need to cure that first before you attempt, you know, a napping protocol. If your night sleep is dialed in, your daytime naps are very helpful for brain function, for memorization, for cognitive tasks, for focus later in the day, um, for athletic um, you know, enhancement, things like that. So naps are actually uh, very good if you use them right. Um, again, if you, if you go into like a deep sleep and you're there for like, a, you know, 90 minutes, it's like, okay, yeah, you totally messed up. That's, that's not good. Caffeine, wonderful. Caffeine is wonderful. Uh, but you know how it works. It blocks adenosine. Uh, it's a competitive inhibitor of adenosine, which is that molecule that gives us our sleep pressure. It builds up, builds up, builds up, builds up. We have sleep pressure. And adenosine binds and binds and binds and binds. And as adenosine is binding, we are getting more and more tired, more and more ready to flip that switch into, into slumber. Now, when you have caffeine, caffeine and the half-life, it depends on who you are. Everyone here has a different half-life. You know, it depends how you metabolize this. But let's say, it's, let's just say it's like five hours, something like that. Um, you're, if, if you're drinking caffeine six hours before going to bed, five or six hours after drinking it, half of it is still in there. That's what half-life means. And you're still getting a pronounced effect. Your body thinks you're hours ago. You are nowhere ready for bed. You don't have that sleep pressure built up yet. Now, some people can metabolize this very effectively, um, just like with alcohol. Um, you know, we see different enzymatic profiles. Um, and you, you remember the talk on Asian glow. Um, there, there are different uh, metabolisms of these things. So there are people who can drink caffeine, drink coffee, whatever, have caffeine, and we're talking about coffee because that's what everyone drinks. Um, at 10 o'clock p.m. and at 10.30 p.m. they're asleep and it doesn't, it doesn't wake them up. But pay attention. Uh, there aren't that many of those people. Everyone claims to be that person in the same way that everyone says, like, I'm allergic to bees. No, you're not. You just, you don't want to be stung. Nobody wants to be stung. Being stung doesn't mean you're allergic to a bee. Like, where's your EpiPen? Well, uh, again, you're not allergic. You're just scared of bees. You're scared of pain. Um, and so people always say these things. And uh, and so like, well, you know, I, I am totally um, insensitive to caffeine. That's probably not true. You probably just haven't paid attention and documented it. Um, you know, if you were to actually keep a database and we were to run some analyses on it, it's likely that we would get a different story from the stories we tell ourselves. Now, I'm very sensitive to caffeine um, and I drink it. Uh, if I drink it first thing in the morning, it's not as effective. Uh, because what I want is to start waking up first. I don't want the caffeine to do the job of waking me up so my body doesn't have to do it. I don't want to have a surrogate uh, uh, focus source, right? I want my body to start waking up, waking up, waking up, cortisol, epinephrine, uh, body temperature, and then um, you know, I'm, I'm building up a little bit of, of adenosine as I go throughout the day. Now I have something to block. 
as you build up a little bit of adenosine, as you wake up and become more and more alert, now you're going to get a more pronounced effect on your caffeine. If you wake up at 7 and by 7.03, the coffee is, is already down your esophagus, that it's not going to be as effective. Um, and I like to actually get something out of it. I only do caffeine three days a week. It's not true. I do caffeine every day, but sometimes it's in the form of tea. I only do strong coffee uh, three days a week, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Those are my three strong caffeine days. Um, the other days I do light caffeine and green tea, stuff like that. Uh, but using caffeine to your effect, you want to get more out of these drugs than they get out of you. You want to be able to use these things to their maximum effect without having to rely on them, without being dependent on them. Because when you're dependent, they give you the wrong, you know, like you have a, a drug lord and like at first they give you the good stuff, like you get the clean Coke or something, and then you become an addict and they start giving you the shitty stuff. It's like, why is my Coke green? And like, it's like brown and green and it has hair in it. And is that moss? And like, you know, that's, you don't want to be that person. You don't want to be an addict who needs caffeine and is not doing what it's supposed to anymore. You want to get the most out of it um, with the least consequence. Get more out of these compounds than they get out of you. And with caffeine, um, I wait a little while. I wake myself up a little bit, give myself an hour or two to become more alert. I've already used the sunlight to, to uh, set my circadian rhythm. And especially Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, I'm always outside on my caffeine days. I, I make sure I wake myself up, get myself out of bed, um, get my temperature rising, get that epi cortisol brewing. Um, and then... I, I introduce once I have feel like okay adenosine starting to build a little bit let me put this to work that's the optimal time uh, to use your caffeine um, now sleeping drugs I mentioned this I talked about this earlier um, this is Ambien here uh, Zolpidem is Ambien I took Ambien I think that's the one I fell down the, the stairs with I can't remember what that pill was uh, they don't really work in the way that people hope they do. They don't work, work in the way that people, um, the, certainly the pharmaceutical con, uh, companies report. And the incidence of cancer, this is just one study. Look up, just look, you can Google this stuff. Just Google Scholar, go to PubMed, go, go wherever and just look up these, these uh, sleep aids and not sleep aids um, like uh, magnesium. Or, or theanine, or these these sort of very natural things I take that I was tempted not to mention, um, because those aren't nearly as important. Because what people want to do is put pills in their mouth. What's the easiest possible way so I can still check my email from bed? That's what people want to do, but it doesn't work that way. Um, it never has, it never will. Well, never will is a bold statement, and I actually take it back, because there are possibilities okay let's there's a, the hypothalamus has has a lot of of roles that we can maybe partner with um the thalamus itself right the gate for um for sensation there, there's there's stuff we could do there i mean there, there's a lot of roles but we are nowhere near effective pharmacological interventions we are decades past understanding natural interventions that are so much more potent so much more effective and so side effect free uh, than anything a pharmaceutical company can make. Now, the cancer, this is, there, this is sort of speculative of why is the cancer rate really high? And it is, the cancer rate is high. Um, take this stuff and I mean, these are carcinogenic. Why though? That's the speculative part, not whether. Whether, fine. We, we're we're pretty we're pretty settled on that answer. Is it possible that they that they that is just fluke over and over and over? Okay, sure. But statistically, is that likely? No. Uh, the most statistically, we are very confident, not sure, but very confident that these these drugs uh, increase the risk of cancer and do so pretty rapidly. The mechanism that is proposed at the moment, and this may change, is that they are you are you are impairing your sleep, but not sedation. You are arriving at a sleep-like state, which does not elicit the benefits, the perks of real sleep. You're getting counterfeit sleep with these things. You went out, you missed out on the world for some hours. And then you re-entered the world and what you thought you were doing was sleeping. 
but it's a little bit different from that. Um, and these deep sleep and REM sleep states are a little bit different. And it seems that immune system uh, regeneration, immune system health may be compromised if you're getting fake sleep as opposed to real sleep. Now, the reason I have Mount Rushmore here is what people have for a long time said about there are three pillars of health. And this is, I, everyone said, I used to say this, that there are three pillars of health. One of them is diet, it's nutrition, it's what you put in your mouth. You know, are you eating local, organic, a lot of vegetables, and what is your, what is the shape of your food pyramid? You know, that one, of, one of these pillars of health is nutrition. Another pillar is exercise, physical activity, exercise. Think American College of Sports Medicine. Um, exercise is medicine, is the movement that has been moving for decades. I don't know how long, really long time. Exercise is medicine, um, is a big part of the conference that they do every year. And the third pillar everyone talks about is the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and it, I mean, this is this is common to, to talk about this three prong system of health. Um, we have pharmacological interventions, sort of the, the chemistry addition to to health is the third pillar. Sleep really is the most important pillar of these. If you if you get poor sleep, diet doesn't matter. If you get poor sleep, exercise doesn't matter. Yeah, you, you can't preserve your health that way. Sleep bolsters the effects of exercise and bolsters the effects of nutrition. And it ruins the effects of both if you don't get it. So let's say we now have a four prong system of health. We have um, Mount Rushmore, right? There, we have the four faces, okay? We have uh, sleep, let's say that's George Washington. We have exercise, who cares, is Lincoln, something like that. Um, Jefferson, that is going to be nutrition. And what the hell is Roosevelt doing on Mount Rushmore? He doesn't belong there. He cannot stand Roosevelt or Roosevelt, it depends where you're from. I'm, I'm gonna pronounce it Roosevelt, like I'm from Texas or something. Uh, he does not belong on that mountain. With those other three faces, he cannot hold um, history like those other three faces can. Roosevelt is the pharmaceutical industry, if we're going to be honest about where it belongs in health. Now, what we can take advantage of is the most effective stuff. And that's light, that's temperature, and that's consistency. And then everything else we get to use, we, we get to uh, manipulations of temperature, um, stuff like that. Now, I take a couple of supplements and don't go rushing out by buying these things. Uh, they do seem to work. There is literature supporting this. Um, and it's magnesium and, and threonine. Um, so let me stop this thing. They both work with GABA, you know, gamma aminobutyric acid. Um, and uh, uh, theanine is going to get rid of the jitters pretty effectively. Um, you'll see it sometimes appearing in the energy drinks, stuff like that. Like, well, okay, we're going to give you super jitters, then we'll, we'll try to um, temper some of the, you know, you know, vibrato in your hands and voice and everything. Um, and then the magnesium threonate is, there's different forms of, of magnesium. Um, and this one is, is a pretty effective GABA uh, sleep aid. Um, there's also like malate for, for muscle, citrate if you want to, you know, shit the bed, if you want like a laxative effect. Uh, so that's like the magnesium um, and then the, the theanine. Those two I take before bed. And if you just, if you like wear a Fitbit, um, I seem to get better deep sleep. Um, I fall asleep a little sooner. I sleep a little better on those nights. There is literature supporting that. But what is that effect? What is the strength of that effect compared to sunlight or compared with temperature regulation? It's tiny. It's a, it's a tiny effect. It, it does help. It does help me and many other people and is supported in the literature. But um, but that's not a solution. I mean, that's the Band-Aid. Um, the, the true intervention is consistency, sunlight, and temperature. Okay, that's it. That's it for us in sleep. 
that went longer than I thought it would. So what's the plan on the exam? Format on the exam, is that what you asked? Just what's the plan like? You're, no, you're the plan, okay. Uh, I'll do multiple choice for this. It, it's There's nothing coming from the first block. Pre-first okay. test, I, everybody here, I mean, the reason I'm structuring the class this way is you've all been such good students. You know, everybody's interested and ask questions and, and it's like, you're good. And so I don't need to, you know, have like this academic grudge to try to get you up to speed. Like that's not, that's not learning and helpful and, and unstressful and healthy and whatever. Um, so the first block, you ignore that stuff. The second block, uh, what would we do like? The altitude, it was just altitude and sleep, alcohol and pot. Is that everything? Okay, so on the test, I'll have alcohol. I'll have, for, for the multiple choice part, I'll have alcohol, uh, weed, you know, THC, um, and a lot of, of um, altitude, highs and lows. And then how about this? I'll change them, whatever you want to do. I mean, I could come up with multiple choice questions for, for sleep too. But if I said one essay question, and that is for sleep, what would you do for yourself to optimize sleep? How healthy is your sleep now? And what strategies do you think would work? If I just did, and it, like, I'm going to grade so fairly on that one. So like super friendly, because I think that's helpful for people to, to reflect, to take that, instead of just let me memorize stuff and, and, and try to like cram information or whatever, to reflect in a useful way. Um, is everyone okay with that format? Like su super friendly on that grading part, but just so that there's a, an incorporation or an application of the sleep. Cause I do think that's probably the most important thing we talked about um, this semester. And I hope, you know, again, there's, uh, Sleep is hard. It's hard to do in the 21st century. Sleep was like easy in, you know, like the, you know, Iron Age or whatever. Like sleep, fine. Everyone sleeps fine. Like, but yeah, in the 21st century, sleep is difficult. It's really hard. And so, and I know a lot of you are, I mean, Nathaniel, you got a rough schedule. JP, I know, man, you suffer from, from insomnia. And I know that a lot of us are more silently um, have, you know, struggling and so I hope there was no reception of, you know, insensitivity of, oh, Courtney's just, man, just grinding his ax, as Mark says. That's like Van Ness's expression, grinding the ax. Um, so I hope, I hope nobody felt like, man, Courtney is just hammering a thing I'm struggling with. Um, but, uh, but it's just, it's so important and, it, and there are remedies. And so I think that's what the format will be is, is I'll phrase the question something like, how is your sleep now? If there are strategies to improve, what would you incorporate and how do you, you know, explain a mechanism of, of effectiveness, something like that. And then I'll have multiple choice questions for the rest. Is, uh, is there gonna be that check, checklist of stuff to know being posted as well? Yes, I will post that. Um, I, I still have to, I am, yeah, I'll post that. I didn't make a checklist of stuff to know from Monday's lecture of, of that material. So I can make those. Um, let me let me get the test up first. So just a sequence of things that I think will be best for you is access to the test and then checklist of stuff to know. And so it might take an extra day or something for me to get that assembled but I'll try to have the actual test up tomorrow and sort of like, you know, by Friday or something like that, I'll get the um, checklist of stuff to know posted. Cause I, I want to do today's and Monday's. And so it might take me like five hours or something to actually make the slides, uh, but it's coming. Yeah. Do you want us to like send the essay question separately or just like type it up ahead of time and copy paste it on the test? Oh, just you send it separately. Yeah, whenever you want to do it. You know, you could do it today if you want because you know what the question is, but I'll, I'll phrase it. Um, again, the grading on, on that is going to be super, super friendly, but take mm -hmm. it seriously. Um, just, 
you know, out of respect for all of us, <laughs> um, take it seriously. And, but the grading, you'll be satisfied. Um, but um, but I just think it's an important subject for all of us to, to you know, try on. Um, it's less important for people who just slumber soundly, but whatever, do, do it anyway, even if that's you. And then also for the, um, about sleep on performance, would you say um, like athletes would benefit more from an increased number, I guess, or hours of sleep or um, the, the light, light, light stage or heavy stage of them being w woken up at? There's, um, it's going to be REM and deep. That's really going to be um, critical uh, for, for both, but deep sleep tends to be more important for athletes. So let's say, you know, let's say you have an event tomorrow. You're, let's say you're a musician or you're an athlete or you're, you're, it's like archery or it's basketball or it's, it's playing the cello or whatever. Motor coordination is so important. Motor coordination, you're gonna be practicing your drills or your scales, whatever movements uh, that you're doing. If it's football, you're like, okay, we're doing the blue 52 move or something. And sort of practicing those, those um, motor patterns. And the motor pattern part, deep sleep is really critical for that. REM sleep is very important too though. <laughs> but for athletes, I would say the most important thing is deep sleep and you get that early in the night that the first thing when you're going through those ultradian cycles, you favor deep sleep early and less and less as you go. REM sleep, not much early and it gets more and more as you go. So if you're a little bit nervous, you're an athlete and you just can't sleep the night before the game, it's not as detrimental because you do probably get the same amount of deep sleep maybe not the same amount but but you know you're, you're getting an adequate amount of deep sleep even if you have a, a compromised total duration of sleep because you're just nervous about the game or something so there is motor mapping um that can happen even with a little bit of compromised sleep that night um you will make it up you you will re you remember what type of sleep you lost and that deficit you, your body will try to pay back but remember you never quite fully pay back a deficit you accumulate debt and you never quite pay it back. Um, so the best thing to do is just not accumulate debt. Uh, but the first thing you restore, if you have like total sleep deprivation or just you know REM and, and uh, deep sleep are both suppressed, uh, the thing that you restore first is going to be deep sleep. And then once you've sort of paid a lot of that back, uh, then you move on to uh, recovering REM sleep. But deep sleep tends to be a little bit more important for that context. So waking up at a lighter stage and getting say like six hours of sleep compared to sleeping, let's say eight hours or more, but waking up in a uh, heavier stage of sleep would uh, be a bit more beneficial to performance. I see what you're saying. Yeah, uh, I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm not saying there isn't an answer or that researchers don't know. I think researchers have something to say about it, but it's not something that I specifically have read. Um, but I do get what you're saying. And and waking up in deep sleep, uh, like when somebody wakes up from, you're just gonna take a nap later and you're sort of groggy all day and that transition into the, into the alertness doesn't really happen. And I, I, I'm unaware of the state of evidence of what would you prefer? Um, my hunch, which is really wobbly, is that if I were an athlete and I had you know a game at ten or something, um, and I could I could wake up after six hours of sleep at the right time, the old, finish the ultradian cycle, you know, my little light sleep, and here I am, um, I would wobbly hunch I would prefer that to aroused by an alarm clock in deep sleep, even if I got a little bit more sleep, you know, I went through another cycle or something, but it's, I, I got you out of deep sleep. Like, oh, what? And you're sort of like, um, sort of zombie groggy. But that's, that's a question that um, the literature would answer better than I did. Um, that's just my hunch. Okay. All right. Uh, I, I know like at least one person has, has non-class related questions. So I'm going to stop the recording.
and stick around for whoever has like non-sleep questions. And I'll get, I'll get everything posted as soon as I can. Um, but no more class. I will be in touch. I'll be actually more available, you know, even though we don't have class. Deadlines are sort of happening. And so my availability is actually increasing as, as we go forward. Um, so if you have questions, whether it's class related, non-class related, uh, just let me know, reach out, text or email or, or whatever. And, and I'll try to be as punctual as I can with um, getting the test up and, and the review slides. Do you think you'll still have uh, office hours next week? Um, we can chat next week if you have, if you have questions. Um, I don't think I'm gonna do like office hours where it's like an official thing. But if, if you want to get together and chat, I can, I can make time. So I can do like by schedule, like by appointment office hours or something. Cool. All right. I'll see people.